name anymore because we specified this single percent. But two is just a name. This this diagram will be the definition of the set of natural numbers. There's no we don't first build a set and then show it has some property. This diagram will define it, and it will define it only up to isomorphism. It won't define it uniquely, but it will define it up to isomorphism, and that will be enough. And we will have choice. And actually, the way I state the axioms, we also need this non-triviality. All the axioms except for this one are satisfied in a universe where there's only one set, and it has only one element, and that's all there is. Ah, but as soon as you say there's some set with two with more than one element, the other axioms kick in, and it blows it up to a whole universe of sets. So these say sets, and we start. The, we take it that the we're taking the category axioms for granted here, the eigenberg mclean axioms. The category, these sets and functions form a category with specific properties. The, the eigenberg mclean axioms allow all kinds of different categories, some very trivial, some extremely complex, but very much unlike sets. We're typically the, we're giving axioms that determine that it's like sets, that it is sets. These sets, the sets of categorical set theory, are abstract structures in exactly the sense. The elements of these sets have no properties other than those relating to other elements of the same set. Exactly that. The elements of an ETCS ET set have no properties except that they are elements of that set and each is distinct from the others. That's the only relation they have. The only relation between elements of a set is it what I said, one is equal to itself, and it's not equal to the others. Just, yeah. I'm sorry, interrupt. Yeah. You. Go back to what do you mean by comparable with ZFC? It achieves the same things. It's it's you, you can meaningfully you, what background you, they well, are you predicate could, logic. Predicate logic. These are axioms in first order logic. ZFC is axioms in first order logic. So can they and prove? A, well, yeah, you can interpret them in each other. each other. You can interpret them in each other. Yeah, I'll get to that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I will mention historically, Georg Kantor, and, and you know, he spelled his name not like in English. He's, he didn't put an E there. That's not a typo. That's, that, that's the way he spelled his name in German. Uh, Georg Kantor was explicit that the elements of his sets are mere units, exactly like this. He said, they are mere units, each is distinct from the others, and they have no other properties. And Zermelo protested against this very much, not during Contra's lifetime, Zermelo, when he was editing Contra's papers. Uh, I don't know how it is that historians of mathematics have failed to see that Contra did this when Zermelo talks about it three times in Contra's collected works. But so far, I've not told you what elements are. What are elements? But if you were wondering what are they, why you, you know, I haven't said that. <laughs> An element of a set in ETCS is a function from the terminal object. I will write either x is an element of s or x is a function from one to s. They mean the same thing. It's just by definition. That's what we mean by an element of a set. Now, in any set theory, a set has just as many elements as functions from one, because each function from one is defined by picking up one element. So we are, and no matter what set theory you subscribe to, you know that a set has as many elements as there are functions to it from the singleton. In ETCS, the elements are the functions. We've selected a singleton, or that's only defined up to isomorphism, but we've given it a name, so we're, we're going to be talking about the same one all the time. The elements are the functions in ETCS. This matches math textbook practice. Um, I don't know what that F is doing there. Almost no textbooks in algebra, topology, or analysis say that the elements of sets are sets. Now, in surveillance of critical set theory, everything is a set, including all the elements of sets. But textbooks don't, don't say that, math textbooks. They usually write as if sets, oh, and elements, I'm sorry, that's just say sets and elements are distinct types. You've got one type of sets, another type of elements of sets. That's how, it's usually how, how they're written. Um, 
Nor do most textbooks say functions are sets. If you're used to Zarela Franco, you're used to saying, well, a function from A to B, a function from A to B, oh, really, that's a subset of the Cartesian product of A and B that has certain properties. Well, we're not saying it's really that. Now, we will say that every function corresponds to such a subset. That'll happen. But we don't say the function is the subset. And textbooks don't normally say that. Some do. Some have a word about it, others say nothing about it. I like, I like to quote Lang's Algebra. Uh, I think Lang has two books called Algebra. I'm talking about his graduate text, Algebra. It's in its third edition now. He says what he needs about functions. He never defines a function, but he says what he needs. He, he constantly indicates a function has a domain and codomain. And it takes a well-defined value for each element of the domain. He says, this is a quote of him. If f from a to b is a mapping of one set to another, we write x goes to f of x to denote the effect of f on an element x of a. Notice that the elements of x are written in a different typeface than the sets. <coughs> That's what I mean by saying he treats them as a different type. He never says they are sets. He doesn't say they're not either. This is, this is what he says. This is his whole definition of, of function, is that it has an effect on elements. In ETCS, the effect is composition. An element of A is a function from 1. A function from A to B has a composite with it. And that's the value of the function at that element. Is that composite? So the definition of a composite function appears in ETCS as the associativity axiom. This equation is just a case of the associativity axiom, which for some reason, when I showed it to you on the first day, I had this, the sides vertical. I like them better when they're slanting, but it, it, it's not important. One of our axioms was that no matter what arrows these are, composing the three of them together, it doesn't matter which way you group them. Now, in textbooks, this is usually often offered as a definition of the composite. Well, it's, it's an axiom for us. Yeah. And I will usually not put parentheses. I, I'd like a lot, of, a lot of people today. I will put those parentheses if I think it makes it easier to read. And I will omit them when I don't think they make it easier to read. So they're not a standard part of notation for me. Well, we have, these things have to be explained. In ZFC, it takes elementhood as primitive. It starts by type, and it defines an ordered pair as some set like that. They give some definition of ordered pair. And then you prove that if two ordered pairs are equal, then the, the components were equal. You show your definition is correct in that sense. And then you define a function as a set of ordered pairs, a subset of the product. And you define f of x equals y to mean that the pair x, y is in that subset. It doesn't come for free in ZFC or in categorical set theory. You have to say something. In ETCS, we take comp function composition as primitive. We posit a set 1, such that every set has exactly one function to it. We define elements as functions from 1. And then we define the value of a function as the composite. Uh, I, I bring this up because sometimes people, they, they look at my definition of, of element, and they say, hey, that's weird. And, but they've forgotten that CFC does stuff too. <laughs> In either one, you have to say what you're, what you're talking about. Now, category theory emphasizes transformations as much as structures, arrows as much as objects, just like most parts of mathematics. And we state extensionality for functions rather than sets. We say, if you've got two different functions between the same sets, then there's some element of the domain where, where, differs, where the values differ. Instead of saying two sets are equal if they have all the same elements, we say two functions between the same pair of sets are equal if they have all the same values. Notice by our definition, it's true that two sets are equal if they have all the same elements. It's actually true they're equal if they have even one element in common because an element of a set is a function from one to that set. <laughs> so if you've got some, some function from one to A, 
that's also a function from 1 to B, that's got to be because A is B right? in our setup. The elements determine the set that they're elements of. But this is non-trivial. This is quite non-trivial. This does not. Nothing like this holds in most categories, even if they have a terminal object. Nothing like this. This, uh, this does not happen in most toposes, which are sets of categories very much like the category of sets. In other words, parallel functions are equal if they agree on every value in A. I'm just, I'm just stating the same axiom. I'm, this is a contrapositive of the other one. Same thing. Parallel functions are equal if they agree at every element of the, of the domain. A subset of a set A is any one-to-one -one function to A. Uh, by one-to-one, -one, I mean if f of x equals f of y, then x equals y. That's why I'm a, a by a one to one function. If it any time it's applied to different element, elements, it gives different values, or if it assigns the same, the same value to x and y, then x and y with the same element. Ordinary definition of one to one. This is not the ZFC definition of subset. This doesn't say that the elements of A have to be elements of B. Remember, elements of A can't be elements of B, unless A is B, because an element of A is a, is a function to A. And a function to A can't also be a function to B. So these are subsets up to isomorphism. Everything we're going to do here is up to isomorphism. But this, uh, do I say that here? Um, yeah, well, uh, I'll often use this notation, this hooked arrow notation, to say it's a subset or a one-to-one -one function. Um, this matches what you see in, say, in, in books on differential geometry. Nobody defines a sub-manifold of a manifold to be a set of the points in that manifold that form a manifold, because that idea is not very useful. They talk about immersion. Sometimes they don't call it sub-manifold, but sometimes they call it immersed sub-manifold. It's a one-to-one -one function from another manifold. That's just that's how they define it, because that they use a lot, very often, if you're, if you're talking about a space and you want to talk about a part of it, you map that part into the space. That happens a lot, whereas you're not much likely to care whether some other space has the same points as this one. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this means, well, let me give a little more of the positive theory, and then I'll get to some of the results that, that cope with, with that. Um, we say an element of A is a member of that subset if it factors through the subset. ETCS does prove that if every member of, of, of the subset I is also a member of J, then I factors through J. Then there's a, a function so that that composite equals that one. This is, this is provable from the extensionality axiom, actually. In that case, we say that I is contained in J. Um, but we can easily have I contained in J and also J contained in I, while I and J are not equal. They don't have to be, they don't have to be the same. Um, they have to, if this happens, then I and J both cover the same part of A. But they could be different sets that cover the same part. That can happen. What we do is, so what we define, this is equivalent by definition, we define this notation I is equivalent to J. Equivalent subsets have all the same members, they might not be equal. And that's that's a genuine difference from, from ZFC. In, in ZFC, two subsets with the same members are equal. Here, we can only say they're equivalent. Now, so we need to say we need to deal with things like intersection, certainly, 
if, the, if they're not equal, what can their intersection be? Well, in this case, their intersection should be either one of them. I haven't given you enough axioms to prove this yet, but what, what will have, what will be provable, we will be able to prove that actually, well, for, oh, what notation are these here? B to A, for any functions, B and C to A, our axioms will show that there's a thing called the pullback, the set of all pairs BC. So those are elements of B cross C, such that F of B equals G of C. This is called, called a fiber product. This is, it's a subset of the product, and it's a subset of pairs where pairs B, C, where B gets mapped to the same thing as C. Uh, maybe that's a little hard to, to think about. Let's, uh, let's look at it in the case where these are subsets. So I use this notation. defining property is that any set, if it's got a function to here and a function to there, so that this composite equals that one, then it has a function to there, so that that composite is this and that composite is this. Now, let's just set this be one. What does this mean? If one has a map to B and a map to C, such that these are equal, that means X is a member of this one and Y is the same member of that one. The only, what this means is you've got some element here that came from both of those subsets. The pullback property says all the same elements of them. Well, okay, so an element gets up here if it came from both of those. That's the intersection. The axioms will show that this composite is a subset. So in short, <coughs> let me write my, my subsets the way I prefer for subsets. If I've got one subset of A, and another, and I should point out, the subset is really the function. It's not the domain of the function. These things are all defined up by isomorphism. The subset is the function. They will imply that there is a subset, which I will write this way. It's a, it is a subset of both of those, and an element one, if it factors through i, if and factors through J, it factors through those two if and only if it factors through there. So the thing, the, the, the elements of A that factor through here are precisely the ones that factor through there and through there. This is, this is the largest subset that's contained in both of those. Now we're used to that. The intersection is the largest subset that's contained in both of the, of the sides. So that, that's actually going to be our definition of intersection here. It's the largest subset that's contained in, in both of them. And the axioms will prove it exists. The axioms I've given so far don't prove it. So by factors through, I'm this point. Yeah, yeah. Remember, this is a category. This is an arrow of the category. That's an arrow. This means there's some arrow of the category so that that composite equals that. That's the meaning for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You could. When, when I say this function factors through J, I mean there's some composite with J that's equal to this. 
Yeah. So when we're dealing with subsets, we don't go around asking whether or not one subset is equal to another. That's not the important question. We ask whether it's equivalent to the other. That's an important question. Do all the same elements factor through it? It doesn't, it doesn't change the way you work. Yeah. Does it, your definition would you damage the extensionability? Oh, yes. If, of a if we didn't have the extensionality axiom, mm -hmm. I would have had to define monics that are not just one to one on arrows from one, but right. that never identify any two parallel arrows. Mm -hmm. I've had to use the yes, yes, yeah, I would have to use the general general definition of monic. Yeah. Because of extensionality, mm -hmm. it's good enough to define this only for, for arrows from one. Mm -hmm. If I didn't have the extensionality axiom, I would have to I couldn't restrict this to have that domain. I'd have to say no matter what domain. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we'll we'll come to that tomorrow with Topo theory. But for for now, we it's enough to to use those because this extensionality axiom tells us that two arrows are equal just in case all their composites with arrows from one are equal. Now, here we're getting closer to what we need an equalizer for parallel pair of arrows. And maybe it's just me, but I think I'm actually right about this. I say, I like to say, I say these things in words and then I give you a picture, and I think the picture is easier to understand than the words. It's important to know it can be said in words. In words, an equalizer is a function e to a that has the same composite with both of those, so fe is the same as gd, and it has this property. Any time a function has the same composite with both of those, then that function factors through e uniquely. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I could replace T with one there. It, it follows that every equalizer is a subset. So this is actually this is actually the subset of A that an element lies in if and only if both of those take that element to the same thing in B. An element of A lies in E if and only if F of it is equal to G of it. That's just what I set up here, repeated in the different notation. Now, lots of important categories don't have equalizers. This is a pretty nice property that lots of categories don't have. But the category of sets has it, and RETCS actually requires it. That's what we're doing. We're taking properties that sets have, the category of sets has, that other categories don't, making them axioms. And of course, trying to avoid redundancy. We're trying to find a good workable axioms. Uh, the choice of E is arbitrary, or I mean the capital E? Um, well, it's, it's any set with a function that has this property. So, so as long as there exists one, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, yeah, the axiom says there exists one. Um, actually, it's a, there's a, an issue you could do it several ways. My preferred way to do it is the axiom says there's a, a selected one. For every pair, there's a selected equalizer. But understand, the selected equalizer doesn't have any different properties than any of the others. It's just that it's a notational convenience if we've selected one. Yeah. So I, when I write A cross B, I don't just mean with P1 and P2, I don't just mean any set with the, pro with the product property. Now. Now, in previous lectures, I did. But now, from now on, I mean the selected one with this property. But I understand that's just a notational convenience. The selected one doesn't have any different properties than any of the others, except that it has this name. But it is convenient to have selected one. It saves us a lot of talking around things. The truth value axiom says every subset is an equalizer for some characteristic function. There's a set 2 with a selected element that I'll call true, such that for every subset of A, there's a unique characteristic function, chi sub i, such that that subset is an equalizer of chi sub i and true sub A. True sub A is just a constant function. 
that you, you map all of A to the singleton one, and then you map it to true. Oh, I forgot to put true up here. This is supposed to, you know, this is supposed to say true up there. So the, the constant function, take all of A, you, you collapse it down into the single element of one, and you insert that as true. Oh, you know, in fact, I haven't mentioned How many elements does one have? Well, it has just as many as there are functions from one to one. And there's only one of those. For any set, there's only one function to one. Yeah, so yeah, indeed. Uh, the sole element of the singleton set is its identity function. The singleton set has a, has a single element. Yeah. But someone was kind of laughing, smiling at that. It's, it's, good. it's, a, it's, cute. it's cute, I think. <laughs> so I think people are familiar with this idea. Intuitively, we've got a subset of A. We'll map everything in that subset to true and everything that's not somewhere else. For the moment, I'm not saying that that set 2 has just two elements. I mentioned it has one element. I haven't said how many other elements it has. I have mentioned that there's a unique characteristic function, which should suggest to you that it must only have one other element. Because if it had more other elements, there'd be several characteristic functions. In recursive function theory, a characteristic function for a subset is often a function that takes everything in that subset to zero and everything else somewhere else. So in recursive function theory, there's often many different characteristic functions for a, a, a single subset because you don't care where the others got mapped. And it's just convenient if the characteristic function takes natural number values, not, not only a pair of values. So I have not yet said that this only has two elements. I have said it has, it has at least this element and it has that property. It will follow that it has exactly two elements. But that's with the other axioms. So we talked about that. A function set. A function set from set A to set B is given by an evaluation function, evaluation from B, cross, B to the A cross A to B. It has this property. For any set C, and function from C cross A to B, there's a unique function there with, oh, okay, the picture's a little easier to see. The picture's not super easy to see the first time you look at it either. Um, what's, what's going on here? If you're familiar with, uh, with lambda terms, Yeah, I kind of wish now I put the over bar on the other. Do you know this expression? Lambda x, well, no, I'm not going to introduce I'm not going to do that right away. Let's just take any function g. From a, set, from a set to an exponential, and let's reason about it loosely. Um, so for each c, element little c of big C, g of c is a function. g of c goes from a to b. Right? I mean, that's, that's the idea. But this means for each a element of a, g of c can be defined in argument a, and that's an element of b. Cushion, I yeah. missed something. Yeah. What do you mean by b super a, b to a? This, the set of functions from a to b. The set of functions? All functions. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. a set yeah. theory. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is a set theory. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But now I'm speaking naively. Whatever foundations you have, this will this will work in this set theory. It will work in ZFC. Of course, if you want to put a if you want to formalize this, you'll formalize it differently in ETC. Has to new word in ZFC. But this is the, the naive idea that's common to the two. If you have a function to a function set, well, what that means is each value of it is a function, which means that for each element of this, we've got a function there. So there's a corresponding function that I call g over bar of AC. It's just defined as g of C applied to A. A function of two arguments. Um, let's let's turn let's turn it around. And I'll turn it around in a particular way that we're going to use later on. What is the addition function from n cross n to n? Right, I want to take x, y, and I want to map it over to x plus y. Again, doing this naively, I'm not really concerned about how this is, this is formalized. Uh, it's, it's worth breaking that up into what I would call the overbar plus, which goes from n to the function set. So this takes any n to what can be written this way. Lambda x n plus x. This is the function that takes x to n plus x. You see, you know. So for example, plus over bar of 0, that's the function that takes x to 0 plus x. But that's just x. Well, no. but lambda, let me be clear, that's lambda. That's lambda that takes x to x. So this is equal to the identity function on the natural numbers. It's a long way of saying adding 0 is the identity function. Adding zero is just the identity function on the naturals. And adding n plus one this is the function that takes x to n plus one plus x. which is equal to the function that takes x to n plus x plus 1. So that's equal to that's equal to the, fun the function add n and then add 1. The function add n plus 1 is equal to the function add n plus 1. Now that looks like the recursive definition of addition, and it is one way to present the recursive definition of addition. So that's what's going on here. It's a, we always trade off between binary functions, functions with two arguments, and unary functions into function sets. We're now taking that trade off as an axiom. We're saying one of our axioms is that given any two sets, there's a function that lets you do that trade off with those two sets. A function from, from any set C to this thing is the same as a function from C cross A to B. A and B are here fixed. Any set C. For any set C, a function from it to this is just a function from C cross A to B. And that's this trade-off between two-place functions and single-place functions that take functions as values, which is commonly expressed by this lambda notation. I wish I wrote more beautiful Greek letters lambda, but these two functions are called transposes of each other. 
and transposing is it's used all the time in, in logic and in every place. It's just a question of how you formalize it. Now these things are all defined up to isomorphism. None of these is uniquely defined. Over and over again, the definition says that at a certain point there is a unique function. That means given the, given the inputs, there's a unique function. But there are not unique inputs that will make this work. There are lots of inputs where given that one, there would have been a unique function. Well, it's not clear there always are, but the axioms certainly are compatible with their being. But as the King's remark yesterday brought up, it's not just the sets that are isomorphic. They couldn't be. That would, if, if you're feeling like, hey, isomorphic sets here are not related to each other, it can't work, you're right. If we just had isomorphism of sets, this would not work. For example, any two equalizers for the same two, two functions have a unique isomorphism. Well, they may have lots of isomorphisms, but there's a unique one that further has this property. There's only one isomorphism, so that doing this is the same as just having done that. And that's immediate. This thing down here is an equalizer. Anytime you have a function to A that, that equalizes these, it factors through A, E prime, because this is an equalizer. So this one does equalize those, it has to factor through there. And in fact, our definition of this being an equalizer was it factors through uniquely. By the same token, this factors uniquely through there. So now look at the composite of the two. The composite of the two is a function from this to itself that, well, uh, that, that makes us factor through E, but everything factors uniquely through E. So the identity certainly does, so that composite has to be the identity. It's the same proof we gave for terminal objects, it's the same proof that we gave for products. The proof is like always. Because this is an equalizer, anytime those are equal, that has to work. Because this is an equalizer, those are equal, so there has to be that. This composite has a unique property that only the identity on E has. This composite has the property that only the identity on E prime has. So those composites have to be have to be identities. Those two arrows have to be inverse to each other. I, I, won't I won't restate the theorem for everything, but it's always like that. There's, it's, not just, it's not just that if I took two different arrows like this, two different evaluation functions that had this property, those sets would be isomorphic. There would be a unique isomorphism between them that made this thing commute, that is, that got along with the two evaluation functions. And this is, this is handled in, in any book on category theory. Um, I wonder, you look at my book, it's a, good, it's a good book, but don't try to read the whole thing up to this. If you just want this, leaf ahead to this part. <laughs> it's a large book, then. Not so good. Power sets. The power set of a set A is just a function set from A to 2. Okay, yeah, I didn't, didn't have time to extensive. What does that mean? Given any, oh, and this brings up a theorem. Given any subset I of A, there exists a unique chi sub I from A to 2 such that I Right, that was our that was our definition of the truth value object. Given a subobject, 
there's a unique, it has a, a unique characteristic function. I is characterized by chi sub I. Not uniquely characterized. Because there could be lots of different subsets that are all equalizers. Equalizers are only defined up isomorphism. There could be lots, but any two subsets that are equalizers will be isomorphic, and not just isomorphic. Somehow they'll be isomorphic getting along with the inclusions. That is, there will be equivalent subobjects. I is characterized by this, by this uniquely up to equivalence. Given this function, you might not know what I is, but you know all the equivalent subsets. You don't know which one you started with, but you know all the ones equivalent to it, given this. But this is, of course, a function from A. Now, A. That, so, well, A, I'll write that there. But A is isomorphic. to one cross A. Taking a, pro a product, a set, a Cartesian product of one doesn't change the set. We can do that. Do you want to do the proof or do you want to mean? The, the proof is, actually it's worth looking at this proof. How do I know that A is isomorphic to one cross A? Well, I know that all products are isomorphic. That amounts to saying that for any set A, well, okay, by definition, this is a product. Right? That's my definition of this notation. It names a product. We'll know that A is isomorphic to that, just in case there's also some functions where this is a product. Do I know that for every set A, I can find functions here so that the, this is a product? Well. There's no choice about this function, right? That's to a terminal object. If, if, if it's going to work, that has to be how it works. And here's the point I brought up yesterday about the constructivity. What function should we take here? Well, I claim that this, this actually works in any category. What function has to exist in any category? You don't know what functions a set, an object has to itself in a category, but there's one that you know it has in every category. In every category, it has the identity function to itself. That has to exist. So let's hope this is the answer. This is what I'm telling you about, about the, construct, the constructive nature. Yeah, this is the answer. You always get the answer that way. You say, what arrow could this possibly be? And it will turn out that it is that one. If the theorem is true at all, which it is. How do we know this is a product diagram? Well, the, claim, the, the point is, given any t and arrows f and g, we need to know that there's a unique arrow fg here. Let me write that bigger, because I'm going to work on that. We need to know there's a unique arrow fg that goes there. But this is the identity function. This thing's composition with the identity has to be g. So there's only one thing this could be. This, had better, this has to be g. If it's not g, it's not going to work. It's got to be g. Ah, look, this f, well, there's only one function to one. And it could have been. Does that composite equal that? Sure it does, because that's one. So g does work. This is a product of a and one. Products are unique up to isomorphism, so this is isomorphic to one cross a. In a unique way that gets along with this product diagram. Now, I will mention, because I'm a philosopher and a foundational logician, that any isomorphism H would work here. Any isomorphism of H itself would make this a product. And a lot, a lot of sets have lots of isomorphisms themselves. Every set with more than one element has more than one isomorphism to itself. 
And every isomorphism will give you a different isomorphism of that product to one cross A. But my point is, we've got a nice canonical choice to make here. Let's not do it for anything. Let's do it for the identity. That determines a canonical isomorphism. Everyone here determines some isomorphism. I mean the one that corresponds to the identity. The only natural choice. The only choice that exists in every category. And that's why I say that maybe this, this sort of constructive nature is because of the generality. This theorem works in any category. In lots of categories, the only isomorphism of an object to itself would be the identity. So it's got to work for the identity. So up to that, chi sub i, we might as well take as being a map from 1 cross a to 2. But that means the adjoint of chi sub i is a map from 1 to 2 to the a. There are exact, every, every subobject determines a map from 1 to 2 to the a. Every subset of a determines such a map. Two subsets determine the same map just in case they had the same characteristic function, which is just in case they were equivalent. So up to equivalence, subsets of a are the same thing as maps from 1 to 2 to the a. And you go back and forth between them by this chain. It follows, it follows from the axiom. This is not another axiom. I should have made, been, been clear. This is not an axiom. This is a theorem. It follows from the other axioms that the elements of this correspond exactly to the equivalence classes of subsets of A. And that's what we want now. If you're, if you're very used to zermelo frankel set theory, you're saying equivalence classes of subsets. I want actual subsets. Well, we don't have that in this, in this framework. But equivalence classes are great. The equivalence class determines exactly which, which elements they are members of the subset, and that's what we really want to know. The ETCS axiom of infinity says there is a set N with a selected element 0 and a, and a selected function S such that uh, this is actually a coalgebra for a certain triple. <laughs> uh, for any set T, if t has a selected element or a function of itself, there's a unique function there that takes zero to that and that, that makes these composites equal. I'm told where I want to take, where to take zero, and, what to, and given anything, what to do with the next thing. S is a successor function. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, okay, yes. Yeah. yeah, S is a successor. Call it the successor function. That's why it's written in S. Um, so for example, so let's let t also be n. Let's take n and a function that I haven't defined yet, but the two times function. You'll believe me that we can define a two times function. We, we, we probably will in a, in a little bit, but, but for now. Um, and let's start it at, well, at 1, but what is 1? That's successor of 0. Let's start it as successor of 0. This axiom says, go back up to this thing, which starts at 0. and goes over by successor to n, there is a unique function u such that, oh, yeah, such that u of 0 is successor of 0. And what's u of, let's just take n to be any element of this thing. Oh, oh any element here. What's, what's success? So we could take n here. We've got some n. Let's take its successor. Now let's take u of it. u of the successor of n has to be u of n. T 
times 2. Because that's what we do with u of n and multiply by 2. There's a unique function such that this function takes 0 to 1 and takes the successor of anything to, to that thing to double. And you know this, this function. That's the function u of n equals 2 to the n. <coughs> no? Two times. Two times. Oh, uh, no, I started. Uh, uh, two to the zero. No, two to the uh, Yeah. Two to the zero is one. Yeah. Yeah, it's two to the yeah. So, So, yeah, u of zero is, is zero u of successor of 0 is 2 times u of 0, which is 2. u of successor of that is 2 times that, which is, which is 4. Yeah. So this, 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 this just tracks along. It takes, it takes 0 to 1, and it takes 1 to, to 2, and it takes 2 to 4, and it takes 3 to 8. Okay. Uh. Then very simple. Why zero cannot be equal one? Hmm? What? Why zero and the one are different elements? Oh, oh! Actually, and it does. It why does not. Two are different. Yeah, it does not follow from anything I've said so far that zero isn't successor is is not one. But it does when I get to that last axiom about there there are some set has two different elements. Because oh, and how does it follow? Once we know that there's a set with two different elements, let's take that set. So, once we know there is a set S with X an element and Y an element, and x not equal to y. Now let's put s down here. Let's put x here. Here let's put the function s. Let's map it all down to 1 and map that up by y. So this, this function has to take 0 to x and it has to take successor of x to x followed by this function, but this function takes everything to y. So this function takes 0 to x and everything else to y, and x is not equal to y. So there have to be, so 1 can't be equal to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. But so far, uh, I showed you the slide, but we haven't really discussed it, <coughs> that any set has two different elements. This is typical of algebraic theories in general. I mentioned this might remind you of algebraic set theories. Algebraic theories normally allow a trivial model where everything is equal. There is only one element in the domain, everything is equal to everything. This one would allow that, except that I have one axiom saying it's not the case. And now I think it's a good time to break. <laughs>